It's 1918. The war began in 1914. There is no end in sight, and the men fighting for both the Entente and the Central Powers are fed up. And what does that mean? It means mutiny on both sides. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the Finnish Civil War began, and the Ukrainian one continued. There was naval action in the North Sea and at the Dardanelles. The Germans finally decided where their Western Front spring offensive would take place, and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was trying to maneuver around Army Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig. Those machinations continued this week. The Allied Supreme War Council met January 31st at Versailles and ordered Haig to remain on the defensive in the West until at least the spring. They then discussed French and British Army reserves, a fairly important issue. Lloyd George proposed an inter-allied reserve created from both French and British armies, with French General Ferdinand Foch in charge of it. Haig had a suspicion that this was another attempt at creating an overall generalissimo. So once the politicians had approved the idea, he asked the tricky question of who he should, in that case, appeal to for access to his own reserves. His chief of staff, Willie Robertson, in London, or a French general? It's a pretty good point. I mean, the commander-in-chief should have access to his own reserves. So it followed that the only way this proposed system would work would be if the man commanding the reserves was, in fact, the overall commander in France. A committee was set up to deal with this issue. Foch was its president. Now, last week we saw Henry Wilson appointed chief of staff to the new Allied General Staff in France. Wilson wanted Robertson's power from London reduced. So, Robertson's request to be on this reserve committee was denied. Robertson actually called the Council's Executive War Board the Versailles Soviet and said that having two chiefs of staff for one army would destroy confidence among the troops. He may be right. On the second, the Council meeting will end after an enlargement of its powers is announced. Speaking of actual Soviets, there was a lot going on with the Bolsheviks this week. On the 27th, they broke off diplomatic relations with Romania. On the 29th, Bolshevik troops enter Kiev and Odessa in Ukraine. And on the 31st, with large parts of Ukraine coming under his control, within two weeks the Red Navy and then the Red Army will officially be formed. Thing is, on February 1st, the Central Powers officially recognized the Ukrainian Republic. The Rada, the Ukrainian parliament, had voted for Ukrainian independence and a separate peace with the Central Powers. But this would deprive Russia of a big chunk of its economic base for its claim to great power status if that happened. This was part of an interesting German strategy. Foreign Minister Richard von Kuhlmann, nominally leader of the German delegation for the ongoing peace talks between Russia and the Central Powers, had gone into those negotiations, telling the German Reichstag that he would stick with the July 1917 peace resolution formula of no annexations or indemnities. The wording around this, though, was really vague. But that didn't matter at first. Kuhlmann and his Austrian counterpart, Count Otto Karchernin, figured that if the Russian Bolshevik government turned out to be as short-lived as everyone expected, then the armistice would, as it had, detach Petrograd from the Allies and pull the Russian soldiers home. Saying that they weren't after annexations and indemnities meant they could make a separate peace with Russia, but keep a free hand in the lands they'd occupied, none of which were ethnically Russian, and sort of stage-managed declarations of independence. So self-determination could be used to push back Russia's borders and create supposedly independent buffer states. Back on Christmas Day, the two had scored a PR victory with their Christmas Declaration, which offered to negotiate a peace without annexations or indemnities, if the Allies would do likewise. This was clever, since they knew the Allies would not accept, so there was no risk in this declaration. Thing is, though, this plan was now having big repercussions in Germany. High Command, the Oberste Heeresleitung, or OHL for short, had not been consulted before the declaration, and Army Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg and Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff were seriously upset about this. We've already talked about the German military's territorial demands from the peace conference, and Army Representative Max Hoffmann's unwillingness to surrender territory that Germans had died to take. German Chancellor Georg von Hertling backed Kuhlmann, saying that politicians were responsible for the negotiations. And the Kaiser? 
Well, Wilhelm, for once asserting his rights as an Arbeiter, endorsed a statement by Hertling that the Christmas Declaration was a legitimate move in the political game, that annexations in the East should be minimized, and that cooperation with Austria-Hungary was of cardinal importance. So the German military and the politicians seem to be standing on opposite sides of the same side. There was turmoil within Germany itself this week as well. Huge workers' strikes, first in Berlin, then Kiel, Munich, and Hamburg. More than 400,000 workers struck. Martial law was declared, and the strike soon ended. And I'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. Right now, I need to talk about chaos within the actual armed forces. On February 1st, there was an Austrian naval mutiny at Kataro, led by two Czech socialists. 6,000 sailors raised the red flag and announced their loyalty to Bolshevism. They did, however, play the Marseillaise rather than the Internationale, and their demands were more similar to Wilson's 14 points than to Lenin's decrees. National autonomy in the empire rather than independence, immediate peace without annexations, demobilization, and better living conditions. Three battleships from the port of Pula were dispatched to put down the mutiny. 800 mutineers were removed from their ships, 40 were tried, and four executed. And to the southeast that same day, there was a mutiny on the other side, by the Greek 2nd Infantry Regiment at Lamia. Now, this regiment was comprised of men recruited from southern pro-royalist Greece, and many of its soldiers had been influenced by royalist agitators, right? So drunk soldiers returning from their leave during the early morning hours urged their trumpeter to play the prohibited royalist anthem. After that, around a thousand individuals, soldiers and civilians, shot the electrical cables of the city, cutting power. When they ran out of ammunition, some deserted to their villages, while others returned to the camp. The next day, the 9th Cretan Regiment arrived to restore order. Many rioters mutinied again, fearing the repression of the government, and some joined the reservists, royalist militiamen, in open sedition. This insurgency will last nearly two weeks, and special military tribunals will follow. 25 men will be executed. Others receive prison sentences, but soldiers of low rank were punished with suspended sentences in order to force them to remain at the front. There was scattered action in the skies of Western Europe this week as well. On the 26th, the Germans bombed Dunkirk, Calais, and Boulogne. The next day, the British bombed Treve, and the French bombed Metz. The 28th saw an air raid on London with 67 killed and 166 injured, and one German plane shot down. The British bombed rulers and other aerodromes. A raid on the outskirts of London the next day left 10 dead and 10 wounded. And on the 30th, 14 tons of bombs, 267 bombs from 31 planes, were dropped on Paris. 49 people were killed and 206 injured. On the Italian front in the field this week, the Italians attacked the Austrians the 28th, capturing Col di Rosso and 1,500 prisoners. They captured Monte di Valbella the following day and stopped a strong Austrian counterattack the 31st. And that will end the week. Small actions on the battlefields of Europe, intrigue upon intrigue among the Allied leaders, and yep, intrigue upon intrigue among the Central Powers leaders too. There were strikes in Germany and a mutiny on each side. There was also a notable death away from the front this week. John McRae died January 28th in military hospital. McRae was a Canadian doctor who had written a book on pathology, volunteered as a gunner when the war began, and then transferred to the Royal Canadian Medical Corps. He was also the author of the poem In Flanders Fields, which I read a couple years ago, and which I'll now read again as a tribute to Dr. John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. If you want to learn more about the situation in Greece during World War I, you can click right here for our special on that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Alexander Schatz. Your support on Patreon made and continues to make this show what it is. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. Even a dollar a month can make a huge difference. And don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.